Good evening and welcome to The Journey Home. My guest this evening, Father John Zulsdorf, and I think I'll probably call him Father Z, which is his uh, beloved title that, uh, friends, is that generally what the... Absolutely. <laughs> Yeah, even if they know how to pronounce my name, it winds up Z. Father Z. Um, uh, Father Z is at St. Mary's in Wausau, Wisconsin. Although he is of the, uh, if I get this right, Suburbicarian Diocese of Velletri Seignon. Seigny. Seigny. Yes. It's one of those little ancient dioceses in Italy, right near Rome. And uh, I belong to that diocese, diocesan priest. Well, maybe during your journey you can talk about how being a member of that diocese, there you are up in Wausau, Wisconsin. <laughs> Um, also, you're uh, the senior advisor for Catholics Online, so some of you may have run into Father Z on the internet. Our theme for tonight, though, is the power of beauty. Now, that might sound a bit esoteric. What we're addressing is the fact that God uses a great variety of things to get our attention, to draw us closer to His Son and into the church. For some people, it's that great apologetic argument, the debate. For others, it might be a book. For some, it might be a crisis. Things that God uses to get our attention. And for Father Z, it was the beauty of art and music, and specifically, the beauty of the liturgy. And so he'll talk about that in his journey. An, a theological issue also that we'll be talking about is the state or the condition of our will. Many non-Catholics see our wills as completely depraved as a result of original sin. How do we understand it as Catholic? And he will talk about how that issue was one of those issues that God used to bring him closer to Christ. Remember, you're an important part of our program, so call us even now with your questions at 1-800-221-9460 or send us an email at journeyhome at ewtn.com. Father Z, welcome to the Journey Home. I'm very happy to be here. It's a great honor. I look forward to having you on the program ever since you and I met about a year ago. Yeah, maybe a little more. Yeah. I heard you preach. Then you were with a different parish. Though. I was at St. Helena's in South Minneapolis. That's right. And I think I, I heard you preach before I knew that you were a convert from Lutheranism. As soon mm -hmm. as I found out, I thought, wait a second. This is a natural. So I'm glad to finally have you here as a guest. Let's jump right in, though, because we have a lot to cover tonight. As we usually do, introduce the audience to your early spiritual journey, if you would. Well, um, I, th I think I'm not atypical in that, um, especially for many young people today, uh, when I was very young, my mother and father divorced. Mm -hmm. And I was raised uh, by my mother, a single mother, who happened to be a police officer. <laughs> I learned something about law and order from an early age. and. Uh, my grandmother played an important role in this. Now, I was, it was a Lutheran family, although my grandmother was Presbyterian. And I think at a certain point, uh, my mother realized that I needed to know something about God and religion, although we weren't really a practicing family. You're a nominal Lutheran family. I think that pr that's fair. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's fair. And um, she decided that I should be going to Sunday school. So I would be taken to Sunday school. Of course, it was Lutheran Sunday school. And that's where I began to acquire those first more formal tenets of a Christian profession. Mm -hmm. Well, somewhere along the line there, uh, I decided that this wasn't for me. And it wasn't a deep de theological decision or anything like that, but I had a strong reaction against, against something that I was hearing in these Sunday school classes. Now, to put it in the proper context, this very influential grandmother, for whom I thank God every day, she, who had been a teacher, understood that I needed some other things too. And so at a certain point in life, I was about seven years old, she gave me some gifts. And one of them was a, a boxed set of records of classical music, and another was a boxed set of records of Shakespeare plays. And so from seven years old, I was listening to Shakespeare and listening to Mozart and these magnificent things. And I was so overwhelmed by them that I developed immediately an interest in two things, music and theater. And so along the line in my life, these gifts drove me beautifully into being, uh, for
for a while, professional actor and uh, being a musician. But this contact with beauty from a very early age made me kind of rock back in my heels when in my Sunday school classes I was hearing that we deep down in our being were corrupt and that what we could desire was only bad because here I had had this experience of beautiful things that were made by people who couldn't be anything other than beautiful in some way ugly people don't make these things and that's you know the reasoning of a child but it made me set back long enough to detach from this Lutheran formation that I was receiving and so much so I, I resisted it to the point where they shall we say stopped trying to make me go <laughs> and at that point uh, I began to uh, like I think very many young people today and I'm sure that there are a lot of parents who see their own you know children today resisting formal presentations of any faith whether it's Catholic or anything else and uh, I drifted into this thing and that thing and all sorts of other things I was curious about the spiritual life I, you know I, the spiritual things there was a period of time when I was in high school when I actually went to a synagogue for a while not because I was interested in converting to Judaism, but I was very interested in who the Jews were, what did they believe, and the only way to t learn that is to go find some Jews, and where, did they are, where are they? They're at the synagogue. So I started going to a synagogue all the time. They welcomed me very nice, and I, I learned many things. But um, it was this constant contact with beauty, I think, that God was using to keep me on the hook, so that when I was ripe, uh, certain things happened in my life that took me the next step. Now, maybe back up just a step. By the time you're at this stage, you're off in left field somewhere? Yeah, I'd faith, say... Faith standpoint. Oh, yeah, I'd say so. Um, I, uh, I drifted around in all sorts of things. I, uh, and what age is this about? College? Or? Oh, yeah, high school and college. Okay. I'd say very early college. Right. Yeah. But no active involvement anymore in church? And no, nothing formal, yeah, no. Okay. I, I was really drifting. Here, I was here, pretty much a pagan. And here you sit before me with a collar on. At that point in time, could you ever have dreamed it? Or where was the Catholic Church even in your universe? Oh, the Catholic Church wasn't in my universe at all. Uh, as a matter of fact, I think probably if it were anywhere, uh, it might have even been a point of my mockery <laughs> at, at certain points. Uh, so it's something I deeply regret. But it's one of those things that, that happened that now bring me into a, a little bit more profound respect for, for what I've been given. Yeah. Well, then what was it that's, that those things you started to talk about that began to open your heart to the Catholic Church? Well, uh, this contact with beauty, I think, the, has been the most important force. And it's a strange you know, God works in very mysterious ways, and he'll, he'll use some little event to move you, when you're ready, to the point you need to be. Now, I was involved in theater as a theater major and uh, at the university, and I was I had a very good friend, and we decided since I had all my electives done, I, I, it would be fun to take a class together. So he suggested to me, well, let's take a class, and I said, fine, you pick, and he picked Latin. I said, Latin? Uh, that's well, all right. You know, so I went into it. He wound up quitting Latin. It, it turned into a major for me, and then uh, into uh, graduate studies. I went on to grad school, classical languages, and uh, I was just living and eating and breathing Latin and ancient Greek and these things, uh, along with continuing with my theater and also with the music. One day, uh, you know, to support myself, I was working as a cook. And it was one of these classic Minnesota winters, about 5,000 <laughs> degrees below zero. And uh, on a Sunday morning, the restaurant called me and said, would you mind coming in? A couple guys are sick. Sure, not a problem. So I go down and get in my car. <laughs> Nothing happening. I have to borrow my roommate's car. He's got this old junker with an uh, AM radio in it. And AM radio on Sundays was not exactly what I was into at the time, you know, at the evangelists and things like that. Oh, yes, I was very much an FM guy. And um, uh, although I appreciated Led Zeppelin and all its fine qualities. But um, 
Uh, so I'm, you know, driving along, trying to find something to listen to in the radio, in desperation. But suddenly, this beautiful music that comes out of the radio is Gregorian chant, and I, I knew what Gregorian chant was from my music background. But this, I realized, this was live. This was an actual service taking place live in a church in St. Paul, uh, right across the river from Minneapolis, where I was living. So I resolved to go when I thought, wow, this is going to be great. You know, Catholics kind of do big things, and I get Latin and great music. So I get to see Latin, hear Latin being used in a live setting. It's not just a dead language to study. I resolved to go, and I went. And uh, it was the first time I had ever gone into a Catholic church in my life. And I looked around, a very foreign experience for me. You know, I was looking around, and yes, people look just like I do, and... And, uh, and you picked a kind of a bland sanctuary, didn't you? Go through. Oh yes, it was absolutely bland. Yes, uh, church in uh, We're being Saint Paul. Facetious, gang. Yeah, the church in Saint Paul, a very famous place called Saint Agnes, and uh, uh, it was a church built by immigrants from the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and they built a church that they knew that was familiar to them. So they <laughs> built an Austro-Hungarian Baroque church, a magnificent <laughs> nave and beautiful sanctuary and gorgeous altar. And it was a fine, fine, lovely place. And uh, so going into this place, I, uh, you know, I sit down, and uh, the Mass starts. And I, like many non-Catholics who go to a Catholic church for the first time, you know, I'm looking, they're standing up, they're sitting down, and I'm going the wrong direction. But there was something happened to me in this place. I was so overwhelmed by the beauty of the experience. Now, you've got to understand the context of this parish. 30 Sundays of the year, they have a full orchestra and 80 voice choir, and they're doing Schubert masses, Beethoven, Mozart, Haydn, Gregorian chant. Uh, they do polyphonic music, a magnificent thing, all with the Roman liturgy done with absolute reverent care, dignity. absolute dignity. And it makes this whole, this complete experience, very much in the Roman style, very traditional. But it's the new Mass. It's the Novus Ordo. It's done exactly like the Second Vatican Council was asking for, you see. And it's all sung in Latin. And I was so moved by this that I wrote my name and phone number down on a piece of paper, and I handed it to some guy on the other side of the communion rail, and I said, I've never been in a church like this in my life, and I don't know what you people believe, but I, you know, there's a chance someone can give me a call. I'd like to talk to someone about this. Well, that evening, the pastor of the parish, Monsignor Richard Schuler, out of his busy schedule, called me up and said, well, here you have some questions. And why don't you come around? We'll talk. Come on over on Wednesday, and we'll have a chat. So I did. And his invitation to me to come in to the house and sit there, you know, a very foreign person, too. too I mean, this is very, you know, kind of a conservative and older, you know, Monsignor, a distinguished senior priest of the diocese in this very distinguished parish, and I'm walking in with long hair and mustache and beaten up motorcycle jacket, and, <laughs> but I happen to be studying, you know, Latin and have been a musician like Monsignor Schuler had been, and so we, we kind of struck a uh, detente, at least, or, <laughs> and uh, he began to just give me some things to explore. He invited me in, as it were gave me Father Hardin's catechism, yes. first of all, a marvelous book. Yes. He said, well, why don't you read the first chapter, and if you have any problems, uh, uh, write them down. Come on in next week, and we'll talk about them. So what he was doing very cleverly was he was making me teach myself the mm -hmm. faith without pushing anything on me at all. And then he could spend the time that he needed to undermine my weak points, you see. He could spend just what he needed where he needed to spend it. In the meantime, uh, he never you know, pushed anything. He was, was happy to have me come. It was very inviting. And when we finished the catechism, he just said, well, why don't you read this too? You know, here's, here's another little thing. If you like that, you know, read this. And so we read all the council documents, and we read some <laughs> spiritual writers, and we read papal encyclicals, and it was, you know, he was... An old fisherman just, you know, kind of keeping the hooks set and bringing me in. And uh, uh, at a certain point, uh, he said, after a year and a half of this, this man was so patient with me, after a year and a half, he said, well, I'm ready to receive you into the church now. 
And I said, like, heck you are. And <laughs> we went around about this for a while. But I realized that in all of this time, uh, everything that he had given me, I, I had been formed. My mind and the intellectual level had been formed so that I could now answer all of my own objections. Mm -hmm. And that if I didn't become Catholic, I was being intellectually dishonest with myself. But wait, there's more. <laughs> At the same time as that first day that he invited me into the rectory to talk, he gave me that catechism. When he learned that I was a musician, he said, well, we've got this big choir here. Why don't you come and sing in the choir? He said, well, that'd be wonderful. I'd love to do that. Thank you. I was impressed, number one, that he'd want a non-Catholic to do it. But number two, I, what a great opportunity to do all this music. And I wasn't there because I was interested in going to Mass, mm -hmm. but that was, the in, that was the reason he wanted me there, because he got me going to Mass every week by being in the choir. Mm -hmm. And so at the same time as I have the intellectual thing going on, I have this constant exposure to, the, to what Christ does in the liturgy. Mm -hmm. Christ is the one who is acting in the liturgy. He is the one who's doing everything for us. But sometimes it's hard to see that, right? But the way they do things there, the power of the liturgy itself worked on me slowly. But you know those little stone things? You know, you put your rocks in here and you got this grinding stuff and it turns and turns and turns and turns and turns until they come smooth. out nice and smooth, knocks all your edges off? Well, that's what this was doing for me, mm -hmm. see? So I got to see not only the intellectual part, but I got to see the entire history of our salvation and uh, all the mysteries of life, death, and resurrection of Christ being presented through the liturgical year with beautiful music, gorgeous vestments in a lovely church. And it was uh, something eventually that came together when Monsignor Schuler said, I'm ready to receive you into the church now. That's when the moment of truth was. Uh, he knew exactly when to make the move. <laughs> to, to set the hook, and that's when it was. That's right. So um, uh, at that point, I was uh, received into the, to the church, and I made my first Holy Communion at midnight mass uh, for cri at Christmas. And I was uh, confirmed uh, a month later by a bishop. He wanted me to have kind of that full experience rather than be confirmed right away, mm. like many converts are. Mm. And then, of course, the whole thing with the priesthood came yeah, what, later, you know, but... Um, Even at that point, were you leaning to the priesthood? It had been thought in your mind? Well, I, I, can't say, I can't say really that it was, a, it was something that I was thinking about uh, very consciously. There were moments when it really did, and it really appealed, you know, it was kind of a neat idea, but I was... I still had a lot of habits to get out of and a lot of things to to detach from first. Yeah. My process into the church uh, was, you know, I, drew, I took a lot of my baggage with me into the church. You know, there was no perfection at the beginning. There was a lot of the zeal of the convert, but, uh, you know, I still had a lot of things to work yeah. through. And so then later on, the idea of priesthood began to develop. And I fought it hard. I fought it just desperately hard. I, I, I just didn't want to submit you know, at all. But slowly but surely, and especially through the help of some other priests, uh, Monsignor Schuller being one of them and some other priests as well, uh, I submitted myself to it and then seminary, etc. Uh, I wound up uh, doing uh, most of my seminary studies in Rome mm -hmm. for an Italian diocese and I was ordained by our Holy Father uh -huh. on uh, wow. the 26th of May, the Feast of St. Philip Neri, uh, nine years ago, 1991. Wow. In, in this Saint building right back in here. In the building that's, that's right. pictured behind mm -hmm. us. Wow. wow, that's exciting. That's yes. exciting. A couple questions then, uh, and I hope these are uh, uh, fuel for the interest of the audience who would like to call in. Um, let's take, first of all, reflect on I'd like to, to go first with um, the wisdom, the wisdom of Father Schuler's evangelistic technique. Mm -hmm. Talk a bit that now as you look back, we've set that aside because he worked with you in a very unique way. That's right. But there was wisdom in that that I think we can learn from 
in how we can reach out to those in our own lives. Mm -hmm. Well, he, this is obviously a priest who has a real zeal for souls. But he knows with that old Thomistic training that he got that what is received is received in the manner of the one receiving it. And so he summed me up and he realized what kinds of things would appeal to me and draw me in. So he summed me up first uh, without cubbyholing me, right? And then he tailored it to what I needed not necessarily only how he wanted to give it or how he would prefer. Mm -hmm. He tailored the message to who I was, and we have to do that in any time when we're talking to people who are interested in the faith. We have to take them kind of where they are, where they are, not force them into a mold that they're not. Mm -hmm. so that otherwise, they're not ready to receive it. <coughs> mm -hmm. So he was patient, very, very patient, and always constantly inviting. And rather than pushing anything at me, he always, you know, gave, well, if you'd like to read this, sure, read this. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you got questions, come on back. I'm here anytime. Invited me into the house so, you know, I could stop by at any time. Invited me into the choir. So it was this uh, kind of reaching out, this embracing thing. We're here. Come on in. And then uh, he, in watching carefully how I was progressing and changing, he knew when to use business language. He knew when to close the deal. Mm -hmm. And I think if he had waited any longer, I probably would have said, well, yeah, now I know what Catholics think. And <laughs> see you later, and I go off on to some <laughs> other thing. But he made it come to an issue, and he made me make a choice mm -hmm. when I had to make it. Mm -hmm. So the wisdom involved in it, of course, is to take me where I was, be very patient, present the material, be ready to answer the questions, and he was, because I had some hard questions for him. And then he uh, brought me in, you know, that last step. He was being led by the Spirit, but also being very patient, and I think we can learn from that. We think about our family and friends, you know, rather than have some canned evangelistic approach that we're going to shove in on oh, somebody. Yeah. It's getting to know and to love that person. Mm -hmm. What is it that stands in the way? What is it that would be the bait that's needed to get them interested? Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, the idea to invite you, a non-Catholic, into the choir mm -hmm. is a wonderful thing that some might think, well, I can't imagine you would do that. Yeah. But it was exactly what he... And it touched me in a way, yeah. you know, that I can, in retrospect, I can see yeah. now at the moment, you know, it was kind of an exciting thing, but now I look back on it, it was really a profound yeah. thing. Because yeah. he was giving me that... He at the, when he brought me into the choir, he was he was giving me not just the intellectual stuff, but he was also giving that the which beauty. would appeal to my heart. Talk. It's going to bar, more about the beauty, the power of beauty, the importance of beauty in our Catholic faith. Mm -hmm. Well, um, beauty. I, I'm convinced, and our great fathers of the church and philosophers and teachers, and our present Holy Father has talked about this uh, even very recently in his letter to artists for the Jubilee and in other occasions. Beauty is a reflection of the truth. And beauty in material creation is this marvelous echo of the truth that is in God's Word. And when we have an experience of beauty, we're being drawn closer and closer to the beauty and the truth and the goodness that is God. And so uh, the human soul is made for this. Uh, I think it just occurred just now as I was singing, I was remembering this marvelous, uh, this marvelous quote from uh, Augustine's Confessions where he talks about where God was. I think we need to go to a break mm -hmm. right now. So hold on for a second. Hold that thought. We'll be back in just a moment with your questions for Father Zulsdorf, and you'll finish talking a little bit about the power of beauty. See you in a moment.
Welcome back to the journey home. Uh, we had an uh, alarm went off and we had to uh, figure out what all that was about, but everything's fine. And so I apologize for interrupting your discussion of the power of beauty, Father. Let's pick up right where we left off, if you would. Well, um, I remember that there was a mention of St. Augustine. I, when, I, when I preach, I, I never lose an opportunity to talk about St. Augustine. All the, my parishioners know about that now. They're probably sick of death of St. Augustine. Your I wrote my thesis on yeah. St. Augustine. Uh, but anyway, I remember this marvelous uh, line in his confessions where he talks about how he was seeking God outside of himself. I was seeking you outside, but you were within me, and I was seeking for you everywhere else. And then you gleamed and you glowed and you scattered my blindness, right? Well, that's what was happening through the beauty of the Roman Catholic liturgy, see? There was this dazzling thing that allowed me to see farther than just the intellective part and all of the studies in the books allowed me to see. Okay. Uh, before we take some of our first phone calls and emails, uh, th let's go back to this other issue that, as an early man, actually first drove you away from the Lutheran faith, mm -hmm. uh, and that is this issue of the depravity of the will. Yes. Uh, Luther described our state as uh, uh, piles of horse manure covered with snow, mm -hmm. as, we, as God's righteousness is imputed to us, mm -hmm. yet always underneath depraved. Yes. And, of course, one of the passages that's often used to, uh, to emphasize that is a very familiar passage from Romans Three that says none is righteous, no not one, no one understands, no one seeks for God, all have turned aside, together they have gone wrong, no one does good, not even one. And so that is emphasized amongst Calvinists too. As a Catholic, how do we understand this issue? Well, as a Catholic, as Catholics, we have a very different understanding of the fall of man. It's everybody's experience that we're fallen. Right. There's nobody who can dispute that. Just a you know five seconds of reflection can show you know can show that. We just how hard it is to learn things, how difficult it is to choose uh, to do one thing that's good or one thing that's wrong. You know, we all know that we're fallen, and we're all in this together. And so something happened. Now, did that completely corrupt us? Well, no, it didn't. We did fall, and we lost all sorts of wonderful privileges and gifts that God had given to us. But we were wounded in that fall. We weren't totally corrupted. And so there are wounds to our intellect and wounds to our will so that it's difficult for us to know what is good and right and true. And then when we reason to it through diff the difficult tangles of our mind or we uh, are given help by authority and we come to understand what's good and right and true, then we have to struggle to will to, to want that thing. And uh, so we are fallen, but we're good. Called to perfection. Yeah. Called to holiness, which is an interesting statement. And Christ tells us that it's possible to do. <laughs> uh, why else would he say, be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect, unless there was some... Uh, what kind of cruel joke would it have been to ask us to be perfect if we couldn't be? <coughs> in fact, um, this maybe one reflection, again, from, the, from those passages in First John, where on the one hand he says... If we say we have no sin, we're just deceiving ourselves. We're lying to God. Yes. But then he follows it up and says, but the reason I'm writing this to you is so, so that, that you do not sin. Yes. Mm -hmm. So what's he assuming there? Yeah, it's assuming that it's possible to, to not sin. By grace. By grace. By grace. Absolutely. Let's take our first caller. Um, are you ready for some calls? All right. Bring them on. They're going to come from all over the place, which is wonderful. This is a question from Tim from Florida. Hello, Tim. What's your question for us tonight? Hi. Hi, how you doing tonight? Great. Yeah. Uh, my question is for Father. Father, I wanted to know if there was a defining moment when you realized you had a vocation. In other words, did a like a light bulb turn on? I realize it's a a journey, like step by step. But did something in particular happen? Is this your own question too for your own life? Um, maybe. Okay. All right. <laughs> also, uh, I wanted to know how you would discern from what truly is a vocation, from what might be maybe some psychological longing for something else, which oh, that's a you may question. interpret or that's a want to interpret question. a certain way. Thank yeah. you, Tim. You're welcome. I think I'll, I'll, I'll answer the second question first, if that's all right. 
when we start thinking about our vocation, and especially something like a vocation to the priesthood or religious life, I think that we, we can't do this in a vacuum. Mm -hmm. We need a little help at this point, and we need help from people who know something about it. Uh, the first thing that I would suggest to anyone who's working on this is to ask the help of a good and trusted confessor or spiritual director, mm -hmm. uh, usually an older priest, someone who's been around the block, has mm -hmm. some gray hair, knows what's going on, has seen this before. Uh, there are you know, many young, good young priests who can help you with this, but I always think that spiritual direction should have a lot of gray hair with it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing. I think the second thing that you that you need to do is is consider what your own aptitudes are. Do you have the kinds of tools that go along with the studies and and all of that? That's kind of a practical thing. Your own inner inclination is a very strong thing, but it always needs to be uh, harmonized with the advice I think and guidance of a spiritual director. Ultimately, a vocation is something that is manifested when the bishop calls you, right? But uh, on the other hand, for myself, it w there, was this, there was this deeper need to be, be farther within. There was, there was a moment, I remember, when I had this profound sense that I was supposed to be up there. Mm -hmm. And I fought it, and I fought it, and I fought it, and I didn't want to have anything to do because I didn't want to give up certain aspects. So I just simply didn't want to give up my, uh, you know, what I was doing in other ways. But there was an old uh, a priest who said to me uh, one day, well, John, it all depends on how much you love the church. And uh, I said, well, what do you mean by that? And he said, well, you have things to bring, and God is you know, trying to get you in here to do this, so where's your love? <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, everyone has a different, uh, a different path into the priesthood who's called that way. Uh, but I very much urge... Uh, the help of a spiritual director, prayer, great you know, sense of prayer, and real gratitude for the opportunity to have a vocation from God. It, it's something that I appreciate very much from Scripture, which, again, one of those many passages that I didn't see as clearly until I was a Catholic, and that's a Catholic understanding of vocation. Because outside the Catholic Church, often the vocation is, I hear this voice, and so Jesus is calling me to do it. Mm -hmm. Jesus is me. But that passage in Romans 10 that says, how will they hear unless someone preaches, and how will they preach unless... They're sent. Yes. The power of that sending, the importance of being sent by the church mm -hmm. so that when we hear that inner call, it's confirmed and it's challenged so that we know that it's truly the call. And before the sending, there's an invitation. Yes. Um, when after John the Baptist pointed out he's the lamb, mm -hmm. and he's saying, you know, of course, by this I, I must decrease, he, he must increase, mm -hmm. and they run after him. And, the, and he very patiently, you know, they say, where do you stay? You know, like, <laughs> they didn't have anything better to say. They just needed to talk to him. And he said, come and see. Yeah. So he invited them in. And that sounds a very similar to what Father Schuler was doing to you. <laughs> precisely what he was doing. Let's take our next caller. This is Mary from New Mexico. Hello, Mary. What's your question tonight? Oh, I would like, uh, actually, both of you to... If you could expound a bit on how evil loves to destroy beauty. I, I don't know how else to put it, yeah. but I've seen this all my life. Mm. Thank you, Mary. Well, certainly, you know, we're, we're, living, we're living in a, in a state of already but not yet. Yeah. Hmm? Uh, God is, is helping us to him all the time, and he reveals things about himself. And part of this revelation of who he is is through beauty. Now, the prince of this world, the enemy of our soul, has to do what he can, you know, according to his you know, twisted mission, self-imposed mission, to pull us away from that. Uh, sometimes things can appear to be beautiful, and that's a, the most radical destruction of beauty mm -hmm. that there is. They can appear to be beautiful, but they'll take you down another way. Mm -hmm. uh, when we see, I, I think, you know, for example, art, there are all sorts of different theories of art, and, and some people say that art should be merely for art's sake, right? 
Other theories say that art should be a reflection of the human condition and should be telling, you know, who and what we are now. But if that's the case, when we look at some of the things that are being produced, we have to really wonder who and what are we as a society that can produce <laughs> this horrible yeah. stuff. <clears throat> but on the other hand, uh, art also that is really true art in, in conformity with you know, how God made a good creation, and even though it's wounded, it's still good, still we need to look through this art and all of our efforts and everything having to do with beauty to see the one who is the author behind it. Mm -hmm. And so the enemy of our soul is going to do what we can, what he can to block that. And, you know, ugliness and things that are twisted and distorted will block that vision. I think that's a good description of what the, the art in the sanctuary is intended to do anyway, to draw us through it yes. to our Savior and Creator. Yes. You know, the icons, the windows, the stations, all the statues, all of that is the beauty of that is to draw our attention, but not necessarily even the to it. Even the movement it. within the sanctuary itself, mm -hmm. the noble dignity uh, and the reverent movement, uh, not to say, you know, slow or staid or anything like that, yeah. but there must be a, a nobility and a dignity to it uh, in all that happens because. Christ is the one who is acting in the liturgy. Mm -hmm. and, and so everything that we have to do has to reflect his presence. He is the high priest. He is the one who is acting. I'm going to ask a question before I run to the next email. As a newcomer to the church, as a convert to the church, on the one hand I see the beauty you're talking about, but I also seem to see movements to try and squelch that beauty to take that beauty away. Yes. What do you see happening in that? Well, I uh, first of all, I, I don't think, I think that there are, are many people who are setting aside many of the beautiful things that we have uh, been given and are in the treasury of sacred music and all those different things. I don't ascribe to them any uh, malicious motivation. Right. I think there's a, a, a bit of confusion about what the liturgy is, you see. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I think that for a while, for a long while now, there have been many people in, in the church who think that the purpose of the liturgy is to create a truly human experience. Mm -hmm. And so things get very horizontal. And all of the things that smack of the vertical and the transcendent, which tend to be the more splendid, the more ornamented things, uh, they, they start setting those aside for the simple, the horizontal, the things that are that are all humble. There's a place for that. There's a place for that. But uh, that other dimension must be preserved. It absolutely must be preserved. And it's exactly what the council asked for, as a matter of fact. Certain types of music, Gregorian chant, polyphony, were to be given pride of place. They talk about the beauty of the sanctuary and all of the things, the requisites for worship. Just Today I read something. The Holy Father sent a letter uh, down to this big liturgical conference that's going on. And he talked about we need to recover that sense of beauty and sacredness of the liturgy so that every liturgy provides an opportunity for an encounter with Christ. Let's take this next email because I think it, it tags on to that. This is from Gloria Bordeaux Knapp from uh, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Uh, hello, Marcus and Father. Please tell me how, from an artist's standpoint, would you go about trying to influence the priests of today that beauty, beautiful art is necessary in our churches? Because if it's not in our churches, then where should it be? Oh, yes. That's right. Uh, that, that last point, if it's not in the churches, where should it be? You know, uh, something uh, that I have, I have heard and I, I truly believe that the church, the church for centuries and for most of her, her long mission has been the great patroness of the arts. And... The church has given two things to the world as a common inheritance, mm -hmm. art and saints. In the one case, art is God's beauty shining through in, you know, inanimate material creation. And in the other case, it's his beauty shining out through living, animate people. Right? Mm -hmm. And so this is the common inheritance of everyone. And there's this whole factor of enculturation. The church isn't just there to 
take on what everybody else is. It's also to shape culture, and one of the ways that it shapes culture is through this beauty. And of course, the clergy are a key component in this, right? Because the the in the the, the liturgy and the liturgical action, to a certain extent, has been entrusted, you know, to them as a sacred trust for the whole church, right? And uh, how can you how can you encourage them? Well, first of all, if you have complaints about what's going on, uh, the last thing you want to do is get in their face because they're probably just going to get their back up a little bit and you're, you're not going to win them over that way. I would uh, very much encourage you to compliment what you see that's good and uh, maybe every once in a while suggest a slight improvement uh, here and there, but definitely emphasize the things that are good and you might, if there are ever occasions to talk about it or discuss about, it, you know, maybe you were someplace else, you saw this beautiful thing, talk about how that affected you and make, you know, invitations to do other things. The power of an invitation, you know, is very important in the whole Christian life. And priests are willing to be influenced uh, from time to time. Just don't, <laughs> don't go after them. We tend to kind of get a little defensive sometimes, I think. You know, I remember reflecting when I came into the church, my Presbyterian church where I was a pastor, it was one of those churches that it was a, a colonial style, had didn't have stained glass windows, it was, si everything was completely simple and plain inside, there was a corpusless cross in the front, mm -hmm. that was the only decoration in the entire church. And I remember there once when we had an all-night prayer vigil, and I was there about 2.30 in the morning, and I was sitting there praying all by myself, and I was, uh, long before I thought about the Catholic Church, but I, there was something missing here, I'm wondering, well, mm -hmm. Why am I doing it here? I mean, it could be done here or in someone's garage. Or there's nothing mm -hmm. unique about this place to be saying prayer here. Mm -hmm. On and the other hand, in the Catholic tradition, there are some very austere and yes. very simple things. Beauty doesn't necessarily mean rococo or encrusted with right. a whole bunch of you know baby you know babies with wings you know with with yeah. gold frames and things like that. That's not what we're talking about. Beauty is beauty can come in many many different yes. forms. Yes, old and new. Absolutely. That's right. Yeah, but <coughs> not the new at the expense of the old. Yes. We need to protect and preserve what we have and use. In fact, it isn't in that a misinterpretation of that passage that talks about the wineskins and the new wine and the old and that kind of misinterpreted like, you know, the old wineskins are bad. We only can have these new wineskins, mm -hmm. but that's not what the passage is talking about. Well, at the all. point is the wine yeah. inside the <laughs> wineskins. I mean, the wineskins are merely there to keep the the, the great yeah. wine for for yeah. later. Yeah. He also in that passage refers to the fact that not only will the wine be spilled, but the old wineskins will be destroyed in the process. Yes, yeah, so you lose everything yeah, when you lose. when you abandon. You know, it's like having a, a a boat. You saw the movie African Queen. Oh know? yes, great movie. So they got to go down this river, but they have to go slightly faster than the current so that they can pick their direction. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, they're dashed on the rocks, they're swept by the current. They have to go slightly faster, it's a little more dangerous. The only thing that keeps them going in the right direction is the back part of it. it's the where they were, the rudder that keeps them connected with where they were so that they can pick the direction they need to go to be safe. Mm -hmm. Let's take our next email. This is from Connie. I would like to hear what you both have to say about introducing children to the beauty of liturgy and to special devotions. I was very lucky as a child. We had a wonderful church parish where the Mass, Eucharistic benediction, the Way of the Cross, and May devotions were so beautiful that even a child could love them. How can we, quote, lucky ones, encourage our local priests to pass this on to our children and our children's children? Well, um, first of all, uh, I don't... I don't think that uh, I don't think that you can give something that you don't have yourself, right? So it's good to be familiar with the beautiful things that the church has given us, and you have to be a little knowledgeable yourself, right? And then I would I would sit down and explain things. You you might get a book of oh I don't know get a book of architecture, mm -hmm. and sit down and look at the pictures together and explain what this was all for, mm -hmm. and who does the church? Who did the church think she was in order to make such a beautiful building? Mm -hmm. Architecture is an expression of who the church believes she is at this moment or that moment or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, sit down with a beautiful book of art, with religious and sacred art. Listen to sacred music. 
together. Do it together. If you want to encourage your children, do it together. Show them that you value it, and they will help you. You know, I think of the gift of that pivotal moment when my grandmother gave me those that box set of records and, mm-hmm. uh, and both the Shakespeare and the music, and, and my life was would have been completely different had I not yeah. been exposed to that. You know, it was reminding me because my mother did the same thing for me in mm-hmm. the sense that I, my whole life she was such a lover of music. Uh, I think she's got one of the, the largest collection of records I've ever seen, but all my life it was that too. Mm-hmm. And I started classical music when I was like four and a half years yes. old. Uh, so it was in me too, that appreciation for that, which never leaves mm-hmm. if you get it when you're That's young. right. And there's a difference between Mozart and Led Zeppelin, who I mentioned <laughs> earlier. There is a difference. And, right. and beauty shines forth very differently in Mozart. And Mozart's an interesting character too, because we talk about depravity. There was a part of his own character that wasn't the best, sure. but God sh- shone his light through him, not a perfect creature. Yes. None of us are perfect creatures. That's right. But that beauty can come through. Um, I think we've got another email here just about ready for us. I like these email questions. Since You're I, used to since those. I do this email thing all the time. On yes. Catholic uh-huh. Online. That's right. Um, this is John Weaver from Kentucky. Dear Marcus, I have a question for Father Z. Did you have any trouble accepting devotion to the Blessed Virgin Mary? I had no problem with any Marian doctrines. It was, I had no problem with these things at all. The whole business of Marian doctrines or the infallibility of the Pope or the function of the magisterium, you know, not just scripture alone and all that kind of thing, that I had no problem with that whatsoever. Uh-huh. None at all. It all made sense to me. The thing that I couldn't, that I had to really wrestle with, uh, and this was a continuation, I think, of that whole uh, thing that I needed to reject with the Lutheran teaching that I had been given was, how can I be held accountable for the sin of another, mm-hmm. right? Uh, it just doesn't seem fair. And that continued even into that whole process of my, my learning the Catholic faith. How can I be accountable for the sin of another? It doesn't seem fair. Mm-hmm. But it, it, well, another interesting thing about that whole issue of original sin and the fact that we're guilty for that sin is it's a perfect demonstration that we are all in this together. If you ever want a demonstration that this whole huge human family, we're really connected and we're not individual isolated little islands. Original sin is a, uh-huh. is a proof of that. That's right. Just have a couple kids. <laughs> and and uh, you know, you see their own short sides, but you become very aware yeah, some people of say your that own. <laughs> little, little kids can't sin. Well, you look into the eyes of a two-year-old as they're contemplating pushing that glass off the edge of the table. Yeah. When they're, when they're going to do it on mm-hmm. purpose. In mm-hmm. fact, we, here we're drawn, if I could ask one more question in this issue, uh, which is different between uh, our Lutheran background and our Catholic, is the relationship between grace and free will. Talk a bit about how that fits in, let's say, with our own conversion process, our own decision to act freely mm-hmm. in response to God's call on us. Yes, well, one of the great uh, gifts that we have in being made in God's image and likeness is our free will. We have our intellect, we have our free will. We're made to act like God acts, knowing and willing and loving like He acts. We're given choices. We're never forced into anything. The way I like to describe it is this way, and you know, putting it kind of simple terms, but uh, with all of the things that we're given and all these great gifts, it's we have to preserve God being God, right? Mm-hmm. And everything that's good comes from God, and we're saved by God, and everything is you know grace. But what He does is He'll offer us something magnificent, and He'll give us the opportunity to put our hands around it and grab a hold of it. And then once we've decided to cooperate with this, then he is the one who makes our hands strong enough to hold on to what he originally gave. He gives us all the good things, and he brings them to completion. Mm -hmm. There's that powerful moment in ordinations when uh, the ordaining bishop says, may God bring to completion the good things that he has begun in you. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's a a certain way. It's a paradigm of the, the entire Christian experience. It was a quote from Scripture. Yes. Know, that he would fulfill that. Let's take one more email, if we would. This gets us in that question that we were dealing with, with the original sin. Are there any specific verses in Scripture that teach us 
that our wills are not totally depraved and that our concupiscence is not original sin but only effect of original sin. Well, or maybe scripture in general. Yeah, well, I think I think that we can certainly I think that we can certainly see in scripture that man is good and it's very possible for him to be good. Once again, we go back to what we were saying earlier. If we were entirely depraved, then it wouldn't be possible for our Lord to invite us to perfection. Mm -hmm. The very fact that the Word became flesh and you know took us up, it shows us that it's possible to be radically transformed in, in who we are. We're not merely remaining evil. Now that whole business of will and, you know, and concupiscence, I'm not sure that at this moment we you have the, the, the time, time to go into that. It's a bit of a complicated, a complicated issue. We'd have to look at all sorts of different things. Yeah, especially with the time running out. But I w maybe just tag on that. And this is something I didn't see when I was a Calvinist, also sold out in the depravity of the will. Every New Testament epistle, almost every New Testament epistle is divided in half. The first part is the teaching. The second half of the epistle is, all right, what are you going to do about it? Mm -hmm. The application. The application. Mm -hmm. When you look at that, just in itself, if we can't do anything about it, That's right. then, then the second half of every New Testament epistle is, is uh, you know, empty. Kind of pointless. Kind it's of pointless. a cruel joke. Right, it's a cruel joke. And every time they're, oh, Paul, James, Peter, John are telling us, don't do this. Mm -hmm. Stop doing this. If mm -hmm. you're still living this way, you can't get into the kingdom. Implicit in that is that it's possible not That's to exactly do it. Exactly right. Mm -hmm. So what do we call the fact that once we've been saved, we've been cleansed, and now we sin, is it depravity or is it this remaining wound, which we call concupiscence? Concupiscence, right. The desire for something, in an, even in an inordinate way, isn't necessarily the sin itself. And that's where I think a lot of people today get confused. We've got a minute to go. How about talking in a final thing? How in your journey in the Catholic faith has drawn you closer to Jesus, your Lord? Well, first of all, uh, God was so very patient with me. He gave me this gift when I needed it, and that tool, and this experience, and these pivotal moments without which I wouldn't be where I am. Just from that point of view, I have an understanding of God wanting me and desiring me for himself. And from that point of view, how could I not respond? Right. And now he gives me this great gift of priesthood. And the ability to be so intimate with Jesus. That's right. That's right. Wonderful. Father, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hope to have you back on an open line first Monday as oh. we begin the new, the new season. The Journey Home will be on Monday nights. In fact, the next time that I'll see you, will be on Monday night with Mother Angelica as my guest. So God bless. I'll see you then.